Dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be this session on petroclival uh, meningiomas today, a new webinar of the school based ENS section. We have a, a very nice uh, panel list of speakers this afternoon. We will listen to Sebastian Frölich, who will share with us uh, his experience of, on those complex lesions. Then we will have uh, Professor Pierre Ugroche, working in Marseille, and then Professor Henri Schroeder, who already participated to a previous webinar, and we will speak with us on the endoscopy when applied for petroclival meningioma. I will just make a short introduction with a talk, basic talk on uh, principle and practice of uh, skull-based surgery. Because you will see today very complex cases and those cases are not accessible to very young residents, to very young fellows. You have to master some techniques and you have to understand some principle when you are practicing difficult skull-based procedure. And I will try to summarize uh, my philosophy. And the philosophy that should be applied when treating complex skull-based patients. First of all, you have to think to brain preservation. What does it mean? It means bone drilling. As much you, you drill the bone, as less you have to use retractor. And you can try to have retractor-less surgery even in complex procedure. When you are treating skull-based lesion, you need a vascular control proximal and distal control for the vessel, but also for the nerves. It's truly important to have as much as possible the control of the nerve over the course. You have to think about the tumor vascularization and devascularize the tumor as quickly as possible in the procedure. One other principle is to dissect the sensitive structure better at the end of the procedure when the mass effect is released. You have to think also even at the beginning of the surgery, or you will close. The closure has to be anticipated as soon as you start, start the procedure. You have also to know when to stop. Very important, especially in petroclival meningiomas. And I will show you how you can maximize the use of navigation system, CUSA, and of course you have to use neuromonitoring for such difficult lesions. If you would like to reach and be able to treat complex patient at the top of the mountain, you have some steps to follow. First, the knowledge, second, the training. Then you have to work on your skillfulness. You have to anticipate and you, have, you need to have a special attitude. The knowledge for a skill-based lesion is crucial. You can understand and learn knowledge in the books in 2D. No, no excuse, you have very, various way to learn the anatomy, 3D static image, but also 3D video. Those are truly really relevant to understand the anatomy. You have 3D model, you have many things, no excuse not to know perfectly the anatomy. You have to know the different approaches. One lesion is one approach and a different lesion can be a different approach. You have to understand and work on the surgical anatomy. Not only the anatomy, but the anatomy adapted to your patient. You have to know all the surgical techniques and you have many books to understand this. The knowledge is the basic concern. The second thing is the training. You have to be exposed in the operating theater to the best teacher if you would like to make difficult procedure. You can have now different modalities to learn. Also simulation labs, whatever, we have different modality to learn the, those complex procedures. Do not hesitate to visit the mentors. You will always learn something. Then you have to work on your skillfulness. It means hard work, if the wish of a constant progression, the knowledge of the other techniques, also a critical analysis of your own results. And one point in relation with the petrochival meningioma, you have to anticipate. Anticipation is truly crucial. You have to analyze the preoperative image and you have many software 
in order to analyze, this is made with Osirix, a free software with many carotid with the foramen ovale and so forth. You see the petrous apex. If you have to drill the petrous apex, the relation, you can work on 3D images. And this analysis has to be done preoperatively. We have to prepare your surgery. We have also to find ways to facilitate your surgery. And for this purpose, navigation is truly important. I participate to a ski meeting, but those pictures are extremely important. When you made a black slot, a black slope, you have to follow the panels. You start from the first one, and then you go to the second one. You have to control, you have to respect, you know where to, you, go, you need to go, and the area where you have not to go. Those are also truly really important. Then you follow the steps, you follow the slope. It's very easy. This is a complex petrochival meningioma, but you can follow the steps. And when you look to the books, you see the procedure can be subdivided in different steps. And if your experience is a little bit more limited, you can, if you can get some help for, from the navigation system in order to help you for all the steps. It's what I do for this procedure. The first step is exposure and division of the middle meningeal artery. Maybe some of you have not seen for this moment the middle meningeal artery. If you don't, it's not a problem. Take the navigation system, you see, you put a trajectory, it's there. You see the, the middle meningeal artery on your preoperative image, you import it in the navigation system, and this is where the middle meningeal artery is. Then the next step, identification of the arcuate eminence. It's sometimes not so easy intraoperatively, but na the navigation system can help you in order to decrease the morbidity. Then we have to dissect the GSPN, you know where it is. Then the exposure of the third branch of the trigeminal nerve. It's a little technical to open the interlayer of the dura in order to show the third branches of the nerve. Then you have to identify the intrapetrous carotid artery. Again, you make outlines with the navigation system. It will help you to localize in the petrous bone where the ICA is located. It will decrease the morbidity of your procedure. You have to identify the cochlea. You can anticipate where the cochlea is. This is the projection of the cochlea. This is the projection of the internal auditory canal. And so you know, know where you can go. The projection of the petrous apex is here and where you cannot go in order to decrease the morbidity. This is the drilling of the petrous apex and you have some protection in order to avoid any injury to the inter in internal carotid artery or the internal auditory canal. Making this, it becomes more easy. We know the outlines of the tumor. You see the small opening. And when you go through this small opening, you will have a large view. This is the four cranial nerve. And then you have several techniques in order to go to all directions. It is not the purpose of my talk. Just to show that at some point, you have to stop. Know when to stop. This patient has a small brainstem edema. If you remove this part of the tumor, you will if some postoperative, you will have some postoperative problem. So know when to stop. This is the aspect of the anticipation that you should, uh, that is truly relevant. And you should focus on that preoperatively if you would like to decrease the morbidity of any complex procedure. And finally, the attitude. If you would like to operate such complex lesion, first you need self-confidence, be a winner. But you have also to know your own limits. Be self-critics, remain modest. It is a prerequisite for me for a constant progression. Search for perfection, adaptability, push your limit, and be honest with yourself. If you do that, it's sure you can succeed, but always consider you are never on the top. You can always do better. So this was my introduction, and I will now let the talk to uh, Sebastian Frölich, who already participate to uh, many webinars. Thank you, Sebastian, welcome. And again, you will uh, impress uh, all the community with how you handle 
Petro Kai by Mina and Jomar. If you can maybe talk during 30 minutes on this uh, aspect, it will be good. So, up to you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's, uh, it's very nice again to, to join this, uh, this webinar. Do you hear me well? Because when, I, okay. when uh, you were presenting, it was jumping a little bit. Now it's okay? It's perfect. Okay. So, hello, Henry. So my topic is, uh, is, is more on surgical strategy for focusing more on large and giant uh, petroclival meningioma because uh, as you will see it in my presentation, uh, I didn't share it yet, huh? No, did not okay, share, not okay. Yet. Yes, is it good now, you see me? It's perfect. So as I said, um, I will focus on the surgical strategy for big tumors, but I will talk a little bit about small or mid-sized tumor for which is, uh, it's definitely more simple uh, to, for the decision-making, but also for the choice of the approach. So as you know, petroclival meningioma, at least the big ones, it's, uh, it's not a very usual tumor. And it's uh, most often a slow growing tumor, which means that when we see the patient for the first time, sometimes they have big tumor, a huge mass effect on the brainstem and not necessarily uh, a lot of symptoms, which makes the decision making definitely difficult. It's, a, it's very tough to, to operate. The risk of the surgery is definitely significant. But in the last 20 years, I would say there is a shift towards preservation of quality of life. And this was also brought by uh, radiation therapy, radio surgery, which can offer a great combination for the patient uh, with a better uh, quality of life compared to an aggressive surgical resection. Uh, so there is first a question of classification. Uh, there is different entity, as you can see here, petroclival, sphenopetroclival, clival, posterior petrosal, lower clivus, forum and magnum. All of those are different lesions because the surgical strategy is different because the choice of the approach is different. For example, uh, clival lesion, I think it's a great indication, pure clival for endoscopic and the nasal. Sphenopetroclival can be extremely challenging because it's a tumor that infiltrates the camera the sinus infiltrates the cella. There is a meningeal plaque of tumor uh, and there is a big component uh, compressing the brainstem. Nothing to compare with pure petroclival where most often the camera sinus is not infiltrated or only the posterior aspect. It's only Meckel's cave. So depending on the definition, uh, we know what we are talking about. We can compare our results and the strategy can be adjusted. You see here, it's an old paper where this, pet, this meningioma was considered as a petroclival meningioma. I think you, you both will agree with me that it's not exactly a petroclival meningioma. It's more a tantorial meningioma. The epicenter is the petrous ridge below the tantorium. And for a tumor like this, where five is most likely pushed uh, inferiorly or medially, uh, definitely, I, I think I would choose a retro approach, and I think uh, that Michael and Henry most likely will, will choose the same. Here is also uh, a publication talking about petroclival meningioma, but the picture presented here is not the petroclival, not really, because you see that the epicenter here is at the anterior aspect of the petrous ridge, but at the level of the free edge also. So it's more, again, like before, a tontorial meningioma, short distance with the convexity of the cerebellum, perfect uh, indication for a retro uh, And it's not, again, a petroclival meningioma. So Kawase divided those tumors in different types according to the direction where five is pushed, also according to the exact epicenter of the tumor. True petroclival meningioma are those originating from the upper or mid clivus petroclival region. It's medial to five. And again, it's a complex and challenging lesion for which the choice of the approach for large and giant tumor is, is something difficult. 
So in, for me, I consider the petroclival region an area between Glyvus, Tantorium, Petrus Apex. Again, the epicenter must be medial to five. It doesn't mean that five is always pushed laterally. I will show you that in a, in a second. And uh, it often involves Meckel's cave. Uh, uh, petroclival, like the two that I showed you, that were not petroclival, they were not going into Meckel's cave, both of them. And there was no infiltration of the posterior cavernous sinus. It's not necessarily to say that it's a petroclival to have uh, posterior cavernous sinus uh, infiltration, but the vast majority of them have uh, involvement of Meckel's cave. So depending on the exact point of the epicenter, the nerve will be displaced differently. Here, the epicenter is just medial and below five. It will push five laterally. Uh, here, it's a little bit lower, Petrus apex. It will push five upward against the tantorium. Here, it's a little bit more lateral. Depending on the anatomy of this patient, location of five, you can have five a little bit medially, but it still it could be still considered as a petroclival. There is a controversy about it. This one epicenter is just at the junction between free edge of the tent um, and the petrous bone, and it's a tantorial type, uh, but it's very anterior on the on the free edge and it's pushing five uh, inferiorly. And this is a case that I showed you before. I don't really consider it as a petroclival because again, five is very medial and you have a huge corridor above five, above seven and eight to work with a retrocede. Another aspect that you can bring into the classification is the feeders. Depending on the feeders, Depending on the location of five multiple factor, I think we should, with time, get to a classification that will allow us, according to this specific class classification, to really uh, have uh, defined a specific strategy for each patient. Again, uh, there is a wide range of type of petroclival. On the small, pure petroclival meningioma, one or two centimeter has definitely nothing to do with a giant sphenocavernopetroclival meningioma, which is a huge surgical challenge. If you add to this brainstem edema, then it's, it's really tough, really risky. So it's a completely different disease talking about a small petroclival and talking about a giant one or a large one. Uh, what do we know about natural history? Natural history, we don't know much, in fact. We all know if we see a, a patient like this quite often, that it's not a tumor that is growing very fast. And this was shown uh, in the literature. It's a mostly, mostly, mostly completely benign tumor with a mitotic index that is usually very low. And some tumor definitely don't grow. So we have to be careful before uh, considering surgery for those patients, because sometimes, again, patients can have a very uh, long time of a nice life without symptoms before getting into this risky, risky event in their life, which is uh, surgery for large or giant meningioma. What we know from this publication from, um, from uh, von Avenberg is that uh, when you have a change in growth rate before the surgery, if you follow your patient closely, uh, this usually this change rate usually predicts uh, symptoms. Which means that in those cases, we could decide for surgery before having a patient with symptoms. Because three, four millimeter in diameter, especially at the level of the brainstem, makes the surgery easier, definitely. If it starts to be adherent to the brainstem, it changes the surgery. So in those cases where that have been followed for a long time and you see that something happened because the growth rate increased, maybe uh, surgery could be considered before symptoms. Progestative uh, uh, factors are important. I just show you this case of a patient I have seen in office. Uh, I was quite ready for surgery after this MRI, but in fact, this patient was taking cyproteron acetate. We stopped the treatment and uh, this is what happens. 
So be careful again before deciding for surgery, especially in women in this region, progestative factors are quite often involved. And sometimes when you stop those treatments, you can have the surprise to have the tumor uh, shrinking. What are the treatment options for petroclival observation? I think what you must uh, uh, keep from what I said before is that observation is definitely an option. And it's very rare in my experience <coughs> that I propose surgery upfront to a petroclival meningioma, except he is severely symptomatic and he was not six months before. Uh, but otherwise, I always follow those patients for at least six months especially when it's a big tumor, it gives time to the patient to think about what he will have to face, the risk he will have to face, and it gives you time also for you to define your strategy. It's never an emergency. When surgery in the, is in the, when treatment is indicated, you have the option of surgery. My goal is not to achieve a complete resection, it's to decompress the brain stem, to decompress the optic apparatus, and, uh, and to decompress the temporal lobe sometimes. But I am not fighting for a complete resection. The tumor decides for you. Sometimes you have very easy tumor, even huge one, but the surgical plane with the brain stem is excellent. And uh, you figure out at the end that you have achieved a complete resection because there was no infiltration in the cavernous sinus. Sometimes cavernous sinus is infiltrated. You have brain stem edema because of infiltration and you cannot achieve a complete resection. It's impossible except if you uh, severely harm the patient. And if you have a remnant, what I do is I, I follow it and I combine it with radiation therapy. Radiation therapy upfront, it's very rare for big tumors, but radiosurgery is a great option for small tumor. In elderly patient, uh, sometimes I just use a, a shunt uh, because I know that the tumor is very slow growing. Patients suffer mainly of hydrocephalus and there is no need for many years to go for surgery. And when this uh, time will, will, will happen, uh, the patient may be too old for this and, and it's, not, it's not bad to leave it like this. Uh, small size tumors, there is some article talking about surgery for it. It's not completely a bad idea, even if uh, when I see a very small petroclival, I usually say whatever, it's, it's not something to do surgery for it, patient is asymptomatic. But if you think in, in, a, in a young patient of what it could become 10, 15, 20 years after on the risk of the surgery, it's something that could be considered. And I have to say that I am thinking more on more about this Radio surgery definitely is also an option for those small tumors, but treating early before it became a surgical challenge 15, 20 years after, why not? Uh, so should the petroclival meningioma be treated if asymptomatic? Personally, no. no. Weight and scan is always an option and you never have to rush. Uh, weight on scan is good for asymptomatic patient? Definitely. If the petroclival meningioma enlarged, should it be treated even if asymptomatic? Again, it depends of the growth rate. And if it's growing rapidly, maybe it's a good option to treat before symptoms. And it also depends on other factors such as age. If the patient is an elderly patient, uh, fragile patient, it has to be considered. And, uh, what do you risk with weight and scan? What you risk with weight and scan is to lose the patient in follow-up. Uh, but if you follow carefully your patient with an MRI every six months, even every, every year, you don't risk uh, uh, anything with just waiting and following the patient properly. And when symptoms occur, when the growth became significant, then it's always good, to, it's always good time to, to treat. This is a small petroclival for which indication for treatment uh, if the patient is symptomatic uh, could be an option. And for me, it's a perfect case for radiosurgery, not surgery. The mass effect on the brainstem is very limited. And I definitely think that radiosurgery for those tumors is, is a good option. And there is now a, a lot of literature for this. And I think it works if the volume is not too large. And the cutoff of 8 cc 
is uh, coming out from several publications above a certain volume. It's, it's more difficult to control long term, but below this volume, you see that the long term control is not bad. Definitely, the smaller the tumor is, the best it is for radiosurgery. Mid sized tumor, mid sized tumor. I have to say that I prefer a uh, retro -seek approach because it's uh, easier, it's faster, and it's very, very efficient. Even more or when the brainstem is pushed, um, is pushed laterally on the other side, then it, it gives you really uh, a good corridor when the tumor is purely infratemporal. Um, in case of tontorial or anterior petrous type, it's perfect because sometimes the five is, is, is medial or is below, and it's very nice in case of a fragile patient. <coughs> so this was a, a patient here that had a lot of pain, in fact. And I, I decided to, to use surgery instead of radiation because of pain. There was um, a vessel compressed by the meningioma and the vessels was against five. I think this was the reason for pain. And here, retrosig is a perfect approach. This one also, you see that it's going more laterally than internal auditory canal. So it's not the petroclival, it's more a, a posterior petrous uh, bone uh, pe uh, meningioma. And this is a perfect indication for retro -seek. The issue with retro -seek for large tumor is that you have only one entry point, but still, uh, depending on the location, you can really browse uh, multiple area inside, which is uh, in, in many cases enough. I will skip the video of it. You can also drill a little bit above internal auditory canal, a little bit below, depending on the extent of the tumor. Drilling above internal auditory canal gives you an access to Meckel scape, for example, if there is tumor into Meckel scape. I also use for mid-sized tumor anterior petrosal. When the brainstem is pushed posteriorly, sometimes the corridor, retro -seek corridor is quite narrow. And sometimes you figure out, looking at the MRIs, that you will have a small window between seven and eight and five. Is five is pushed laterally and below, and then it may be difficult to work. So in those cases, uh, anterior petrosal could be nice, uh, especially if it's not going below the internal auditory canal. If the epicenter, the tumor base, is below internal and auditory canal with the anterior petrosal, you don't have a very nice uh, uh, control of the cisternal segment of uh, seven and eight. But uh, it's also nice when you have a big extension into Meckel's cave, because what I showed you before, going into Meckel's cave with a retro -sig, in fact, drilling above the internal auditory canal gives you a little window to Meckel's cave very little window to the entry part of Meckel's cave. If you have a big tumor, you will have to tract on it, on tracting on the tumor, uh, tracting on the fibers of five, the ganglion, I think uh, is, is voilà. something yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Um, and it's nice also when you have tumor below the tent, above the tent, because an anterior petrosal approach is a subtemporal approach. And, uh, and you have access uh, above the tontorium also uh, before uh, getting uh, infratontorial after the draining of the petrous bone. A few slides rapidly for the technique. So anterior petrosal is really an approach of the posterior fossa through the petrous apex, through a subtemporal epidural approach. This is what we drill, Kawase triangle between V3, between subarcuate eminence, uh, between superior semicircular canal and GSPN. <coughs> there is a lot of literature about it. Depending on the location of the tumor, you drill different area of bone, but in purple is what we drill most often. If the tumor extends a little bit more posterior, you can drill above the canal and you can drill uh, post -meatal. The advantage is that you don't cross the nerve. You have an anterior line of sight uh, to the brainstem, which is nice if the brainstem is pushed posteriorly. Uh, and uh, you have an early devascularization of the tumor because you devascularize first. You get to the tumor, tumor base first, and it's completely different with a retro -seek. Sometimes with retro -seek, the tumor gets bloody uh, the deeper you get, and the blood and the, uh, the necessity to control the cranial nerve doesn't always uh, work together. 
Uh, I will skip this rapidly, the technique uh, for the anterior petrosal. So again, peeling the dura first, cutting middle meningeal, then you identify GSPN. GSPN is not always easy to identify. A stimulator is very important to find it. Uh, then uh, you, you, you identify foramen ovale, you peel the dura from V3 to be able to separate V3 from dura to have a nice exposure of Kawase triangle and not to tract on V3. And here is the exposure with the different area of bone drilling. You can identify internal auditory canal because uh, with this angle between GSP and and internal auditory canal, which is 60 degrees, or vertical line with the external auditory canal, which I don't like because this depends on the rotation of the head. <clears throat> and then you start the drilling. It's like drilling a clinoid process. It's not very different in terms of depth, in terms of environment. You just need to practice in the lab, uh, but it's, it's, it's very nice to practice in the lab because there is not much difference between a patient and uh, a cadaveric specimen in terms of, uh, of anatomy. Okay, let me just go faster. And, and for the anterior petrosal, once you have done the petrous drilling, you have to open the dura, which is a little bit challenging. You make an opening on the posterior fossa, opening on the temporal fossa dura, and then you cut the superior petrosal sinus, you cut the tent, be careful with the force nerve, and you have this final nice exposure of the exit zone of five. Obviously, you have the meningioma first, but you see with these features, it's like the meningioma has been removed. It was reached uh, from the tumor base uh, first. Uh, a lot of publications say that when it's going below uh, internal auditory canal, you cannot get and have a nice control. Yes, but we can still put the endoscope inside. And with the endoscope inside looking down, I'm sure that uh, Henry will show some, some very nice videos with the endoscope. You can have uh, this control that you don't have with uh, the microscope. This was a patient with a complete six before. And uh, quite surprisingly, she was completely asymptomatic. She was not seeing double because it took her a very, very long time to install this six nerve and she adjusted uh, meanwhile. This was the tumor, and this is to me a perfect case for an anterior petrosal because uh, first there is a lot of tumor into the petros bone, as you can see here, it's almost reaching sphenoid sinus, and uh, it's pushing the brainstem uh, posteriorly and laterally, but the fact that you have a lot of tumor in the petros bone to remove uh, make it uh, a lot of sense to, to get this tumor with uh, an anterior petrosal. Uh, the video, I will, I will move fast. Uh, this is uh, after a, a, a question mark incision elevation of the temporalis muscle. Uh, here, uh, extradural drilling, uh, peeling of the dura, cutting here the middle meningeal artery. Uh, you keep peeling. Uh, Hold on a second, yes. You, you keep peeling and then you, you get to foramen ovale, uh, to GSPN that is identified here. You see the video or not? Michael? Hold on. I yes, think we see, we see it. You see it? Uh, there is something wrong with this video. It's not working. I don't know why. Oh, I'm sorry for this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. Just showing you this, uh, this uh, segment of the video where I control the lower aspect of the tumor uh, base to coagulate uh, under the control of the endoscope, the tumor base. 
uh, and this is very nice. So sometimes even if the tumor base is going lower to the internal auditory canal, you can still use the anterior petrosal, put the endoscope inside, and have a nice control of the tumor base. You see that I have left some tumor around the uh, Dorelos canal, entry point of uh, six uh, into Dorelos canal to keep six uh, uh, intact. Even if she had a six before, uh, I didn't want it to, to cut it. <coughs> so for large or giant tumor, it's definitely another challenge in, in my opinion. Uh, this is this type of tumor. You see that brain stem compression is completely different. And you have to understand that the cranial nerve are between you and the tumor if you come with a retrocyte. So here we are facing, a, again, a completely different tumor with, uh, with uh, big challenging for the patient. With big challenge for the patient. I have the feeling that I am going to have a difficulty. Hold on a second. Je t'entends pas, Michael. Je crois que j'ai un problème de d'ordinateur. Thank you already, Sebastian. Let to know uh, you you share it already your incredible experience on, on those topics. It is better for you. You are connected again. It's running. I see your screen. Ouais, mais j'ai un message d'erreur qui se. We don't see it. Ouais, moi j'ai un message d'erreur qui se qui s'affiche. Would Would you look... pas? No. We see your slide about Fukushima. No, no, il faut que je, il faut que je, re... je redémarre l'ordinateur. No problem. I, I, I propose that uh, we move on right now to the next uh, speaker. And it's a, it's a pleasure for me to have with us again Professor Henri Schroeder, who will uh, speak on the role of endoscopy in uh, petrochiral meningiomas. Sébastien, if you could st stop to share your screen. Ouais, je suis, vous m'entendez, mon ordinateur est bloqué. Je, je pourrais reprendre après, mais il faut que je quitte le, le webinar. Tu peux, tu peux arrêter de partager ton écran J'arrive plus, je vais être obligé d'éteindre l'ordinateur. Ok. Je, je, je vous retrouve que... après, hein. j'éteins. Pour quelques minutes. There, Henri, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay, perfect. Welcome. Thank you to join us again. And uh, if you have the opportunity to share your screen, I hope it will work. Uh, okay. Share your screen and uh, I think it will work as soon as you go over Sebastian's screen. Yeah. So we kicked him out, poor guy, it's not good. Yes, yes, but he will come back, sure. <laughs> so. <laughs> so thanks again for this kind invitation. I just want to give you my perspective about pitoclavial meningiomas and also want to tell a little bit about the use of an endoscope. I think you and Sebastian have already pointed out that there's difficult lesions which we treat with, and there are multiple facets which we should consider, and especially quality of life is so important. And this should always be our main aim of our treatment that we keep the quality of the patient. And that, that is sometimes difficult. And sometimes you have to balance the radicality of your surgery and the uh, impairment which may occur in, in the quality of life. So concept of endoscope assisted is easy. We use a microscope for most of the surgery. But if we want to look around the corner, we use an endoscope because we have this wide angle view, perfect illumination, and we can use angulated scopes to look, for example, into a Meckel's cave, to look behind the jugular tubercle, and so on. So equipment, what we use are small scopes in the CP angle. They have a diameter of 2.7 millimeters, different angles of view. 
And of course, we need angulated instruments to get access to tumor, which is only visible under the view of a 30 or a 45 degree endoscope. And of course, the HD camera is very important to have a good quality of the image. So what is a surgical technique? We start with a microscope. Then we use the endoscope freehand to look around. Sometimes I have an instrument in the other hand and I dissect with one instrument while holding the endoscope with the other hand. But if I have a prolonged uh, dissection, I tr try to fix the endoscope as a mechanical holding arm. So I have both hands free and I have a bimanual dissection as I have it uh, under the microscope. So in the pitoclavian meningiomas, usually I place the patient supine. We have this re uh, um, uh, rest for the uh, thorax and for the pelvis, so I can turn the whole table. The head is a little bit elevated, the cerebellum can fall, can fall back, and we tilt the whole table 30 degrees or 35 degrees, so I have a good view into the CP angle while sitting on a chair. So of course, monitoring of uh, all, all nerves which might be involved is important, so we make a monitoring of oculomotor nerve, abducens nerve, facial nerve, hypoglossal nerve, the pharynx, and we have an, an endostracheal tube, which are electrodes for recording of the vocal cord innervation. So all this is very important, and of course, acoustic evoke potentials. So the approach what we use in pitoclavian meningioma is mostly retrosig. Almost in all cases, I simply use a retrosigmoid approach. You know, in the 80s, there was a hype to make posterior transpetrosal approaches, but most of the surgeon, which I know, make it simple. Sam, Sami all also mentioned that he used mainly retrosig. Volker Seifert, who has a lot of experience in pitoclavian meningiomas, also is using the retrosigmoid approach in most of the cases nowadays. It's very easy. You make the incision behind the uh, ear. We have a curved incision. We identify the asterion. Then we make two bow holes and we make a small craniotomy. And then we always leave the bone covering the sigmoid sinus, especially in older people. It's very risky when you go with a craniotome directly over the sinus because this may, uh, may cause a use laceration of it. So we drill it away in the punch. But it's very important that we really see the course of the sigmoid sinus, and then we have here the knee to the transfer sinus. So this should all be exposed, especially in tumors which go under the tent, sometimes above the tent, and go down to the tubular foramen. So just a lady, what we did 14 days ago, she was a 46-year-old female. She had balance problems, tingling sensation in the face, mild facial palsy, and a hearing loss. And this is symptomatic, so I think observation is not an option for this lady, but surgery is required. You see a typical pitoclavian meningioma going from deep down the clival up to the midbrain and makes this a compression of the brainstem. So for me, this is an ideal approach. It's a simple retrosigmoid approach. You see the T2 weighted images are very important to predict is there any infiltration. Michael showed a nice case. Uh, before there was an uh, um, infiltration of the brain stem, so we have to be careful. But even if you see this image, sometimes it may happen that the tumor is very sticky to the pia mater and you cannot dissect it safely. This is a retrosigmoid approach. You see here is the margin of the sinus. We make always the incision along the course of the sigmoid sinus. You see here is the seventh nerve eighth nerve, the lower cranial nerve group. First, we die, uh, cut the arachnoid. It's very important to keep this arachnoid plain because this gives you a safe resection. And in pitoclavian meningiomas, you see all the small perforators and the ica are running through the tumor. So you cannot simply take a bipolar and coagulate, but you have to look. And if you come to the clivus, I always dissect before I coagulate because I'm always afraid that I damage the abducens nerve. So we have to remove the tumor carefully and always be careful to find the abducens nerve, which is running in the larger tumor straight through the tumor sometimes and very difficult to, difficult to identify them. Then with bimanual dissection, the tumor is dissected from the abducens nerve. 
and the depths we find here, the basilar artery, then after debulking the tumor, we identify the plane to the brainstem. This is the fifth nerve running here. Ultrasonic aspiration is helpful if the tumor is not too fibrous. Then we go to the tent, dissect the tumor away, identify the trochlear nerve, which is running under the tent, and then we dissect the tumor away. And then further up, there is the oculomotor nerve. And you see there is some tumor in the Meckel's cave and that is the time we switch to an endoscope. I fix it to a holding device and then with a curved dissector, we remove tumor from the Meckel case. Of course, this will be not a total resection because the tumor is infiltrating later on the small fibers of the nerve. But here in front, we can make a good decompression and then you can control how is your resection. You see Abducens nerve is here, Doradus canal, oculomotor nerve running here. And under the tent, you see the trochlear nerve, which is preserved along the course of the tent. And you see there's almost no retraction required with this approach, because if you release CSF, cerebellum comes a little bit down, especially if you dissect further. I had one young girl with an even bigger tumor, and I tr tried to remove the cistern, but there was no CSF in all this tumor. And then I had to extend the craniotomy to get access to, to the lesion. This is a watertight suturing and then we fix a bone flap with um, titanium plate. So this is our approach, what we use in most of the cases. Because of the dissection, you see she had an, a complete abducens palsy and she has a slight facial weakness, but I'm pretty sure that this will re resolve with time. So we have always to balance the extent of resection and the long-term outcome regarding recurrence. So in younger patients, you are more aggressive than in older patients. It's another patient, 49-year-old headache vertigo. So sometimes even if they have big tumors, as Sebastian told you, because the tumors grow so slowly, the patients adapt and the tumor can reach a tremendous size before they become symptomatic. You see the petroclival tumor here. Again, it's extending to the clivus on both sides, pushing the basilar artery away the same thing. I think I can skip the video. It's just pretty the same. So we open the arachnoid, we resect the tumor, and we had problems with uh, the abducens nerve, difficult to find them. We could dissect them and present them, but after surgery, she had a bilateral abducens palsy. She had a partial oculomotor palsy. She had, um, has a mild facial palsy and, and, and hearing loss uh, on the left side. But one and a half year later, you see Abducens palsy completely resolved, facial palsy observed. She is really doing well, has uh, uh, a fair hearing on the left side. And we left a small piece of tumor on the capsule, uh, on the basilar artery, very small, was very sticky to the basilar artery, a small piece, five millimeters, but you see there's no recurrence after 11 years. So I think if you can preserve the nerves, I try to be irradical, but if you, Sacrifice the nerves, cannot uh, uh, achieve a resection with preservation of the anatomical continuity, then you should not do it. And she put her, her date of the surgery on her forearm. So another patient is a 46 year old female, headache, slight weakness of the tongue, hearing loss. She also came at Christmas time. And she came with this tumor. She had an hydrocephalus, so we make a third ventriculostomy. She celebrated Christmas at home and then before uh, New Year's Eve, she came to us and you see the huge tumor extending from the clival region up uh, down to the foramen uh, magnum. And in this case, we made a right-sided far lateral approach to also get this tumor out in this area. So the combination of a retro sick and a far lateral approach. Here's the arch of C1, the arch of C2. So we remove C1 and C2, <clears throat> and we make this uh, retro sigmoid craniotomy. Then we drill to the condyle. I never take the condyle, I just go to the end of the condyle, and then we have to resect. But you see, all the lower cranial nerves are, are causing, uh, are displaced by the tumor, pushed backwards, and are separated from each other. And it's, of course, it's a lot of manipulation to these nerves, and the nerves will not. Uh, 
uh, work very well. This is the basilar coming, and here is the abducens nerve, which could be identified and preserved. And also, this lady had after surgery uh, a lot of problems. Here's the endoscopic visualization. We can look behind the jugular tubercle, we can look into the internal oral canal to see is there any remnant of the tumor. But you know, of course, there is some tumor cells uh, left behind <clears throat> this area. This is the amount of resection what we did. So we just to the posterior part of the condyle, we removed the scalvis. I don't take the condyle. I use an endoscope to look into this area if I cannot see it with a microscope in straight line. And after surgery, she had a bilateral abducens palsy, bilateral hypoglossal palsy, bilateral lower crane nerve palsy, slight facial palsy and, and hearing loss on the right side. She needs a tracheostomy and a gastric tube for three months. But then after six months, you see abducens completely recovered. Abducens nerve usually recovers very well if the continuity is maintained during surgery. And she is really doing why she has a bilateral weakness of the tongue still. It was with the symptoms, what, which were a main symptoms before the surgery. And you see there is a small remnant going into the hypoglossal canal on the right side. And we never send these tumor remnants immediately to radio surgery, but just observe it. And in many patients, it's not growing. And you see this is an MRI after 15 years. There's still the tumor. Not, not much change if you compare it to the MRI after uh, seven years. And she's still doing fine after surgery. So sometimes these remnants are not growing and you just observe them. If there is a growing, of course, we would advise for radio surgery. <clears throat> it's another patient, it's a 36 year old female. She came very late. We saw her three, you know, I think two years earlier and advised for surgery, but she refused. And then she came with ocular motor palsy, trochlear palsy, facial numbness. And she has this kind of tumor. The tumor is mainly located supratentorial, and the tumor goes down to the level of the internal artery canal. And it's also involving here uh, Meckel's cave. So this, I think, is an ideal indication, of course, for the anteopetrosectomy, the Kavase approach, <clears throat> what we did in this, in this surgery. It's a position with, uh, with <clears throat> monitoring of all the nerves which are involved by the tumor. And then here we drill the petrous apex. Here is a cochlea, you cannot drill that. We dissect <clears throat> the trigeminal nerve, identification of the abducens nerve in the depths, and here's a trochlear nerve. And then when we try to remove the tumor, what Sebastian already mentioned so nicely and showed the video, you have a blind corner, you cannot look beyond this bony edge. And that is very nice to use an endoscope and you see the facial nerve and you see the uh, cochlear nerve and with a curved curate and the endoscopic visualization, you can remove this tumor, which is deep down in that area. <clears throat> and then I removed the tumor, which was sticky to the middle midbrain against the advice of Michael. And this may cause a problem and you see it on the post of MRI. So this is the amount of bone what we removed. And you see there is a small infarction in the lateral part of the midbrain. So the lateral part of the midbrain is very forgiving. That's why I said as a young girl, I take the tumor away completely, but you see this will cause a damage. So if you have a tumor capsule very sticky to the brains, then please don't take it away because this may cause problems. In the lateral midbrain, as I said, it's not a big deal. So she had no permanent deficit of that. And we had to leave some tumor here in a cavernous sinus. Otherwise, we had a good resection. But you see here, this is this infarction where the tumor capsule was sticky to the surface. So this should be left inside. This is the advice I think everybody <clears throat> will give you who has experience with these tumors. So after five months, she improved. And then after five years, you see she got a small residual uh, re recurrent tumor here in the middle of the clivus. So what is the approach for this? Of course, we could add radiotherapy. But we can also make a transclival approach. You see the basilar here and here was the tumor and we can resect this tumor. <clears throat> so if it is a tumor, it's a clivus tumor, is small in the anatomy of the clivus is uh, <clears throat> a, a suitable it means very thin, it's a good idea. And this is a resection, and this is now three years later. So, anonasal approach usually, I think, if you have young 
people and you want to get a resection, I think anonasal is not a good option because you can only remove the small ones which are midline. That is true. For these, you can use it. But for the small tumors, you could also add simply a radiotherapy, radiosurgery or fractionated stereotactic radiosurgery. But if you have an older people like this lady, she has a uh, progressive visual loss <clears throat> on the left eye and she presents with this tumor. Of course, you can make a Kavasi approach in this lady. You see the brainstem compression here. You see there's tumor in the uh, sphenoid sinus, there's tumor in the cellar, and the, the bone is very thin. So if you see this tumor, of course, endoscopy is an option to decompress the brainstem. But in younger patient, I would never advise it. So this is an endonasal approach, extended approach. This is the area of the cellar. This is a clivus, what we drill. We open the dura. In the cellar area, you see all this infiltrated by tumor. We are lucky that you see pituitary gland is visible. So there is infiltration of the gland. So we have to be careful. The gland is mainly on the right side. And then we dissect the tumor to decompress the chiasm. You see here superior hypophyseal artery. You have to be very careful to preserve this vessel. Here's the chiasm decompressed now. But we are lucky in this case because the tumor was not very fibrous. It was a soft tumor. You can, it's difficult to predict that. So we remove now tumor in the clival area, take it away, and then we identify that Dusen's nerve is running here. And then, of course, we have to stop. So with a curved suction, we can go up and resect more tumor behind the cellar area. But as I said, we are lucky in this case because this is a soft tumor. You see oculomotor nerve running here, the posterior cerebral artery over it, and below is the supracerebellar artery. And we had uh, quite a good decompression of the brain stem. Then we put fat and the nasal septal flap. And if you see here, this is pre-op, this is post-op, so we have a good decompression, but you see the lateral part of the tumor cannot be reached. It's a pre-op, post-op. So it is an option in older people to have a decompression, but if your intention is to have a, a good resection in a young patient, I always would advise a transcranial approach. And most of the tumors we use just simple erythrosigmoid approach. This is her six months follow up. She improved in the vision on the left eye, but still there is some tumor. Then one last case, if there is time, Michael, yeah? Or should I stop? Yes, a short case, please. So this was a case, a six year old female patient, a certain of palsy and has this was, Sebastian mentioned these ugly central skull based tumor, sphenoclival foraminal tumor of this is a big tumor on both sides. What is the aim in this, in this tumor? Of course, her complaint is oculomotor palsy and is optic nerve compression visual loss on the right side. So what we want to do is a decompression of these nerves. So I make a frontolateral approach, identification of the optic nerve dissection here. This is the carotid artery, there's a good arachnoid plane, although it looked completely encased on the MRI. So sometimes you have a nice arachnoid plane and you can dissect. So we, we unroof the optic canal, open the falciform ligament to decompress the optic nerve. We try to remove tumor in the interoptic window, but you see this is a stalk. The stalk is completely infiltrated. She has no deficits, so we leave it. Then we look to the oculomotor nerve and we want to decompress it. Usually the oculomotor nerve is compressed by the tumor when it enters into the cavernous sinus and we cut the dura around. Here's a trochlear nerve, the same thing. We cut the dura when it enters into the cavernous sinus, but we don't resect the tumor in the cavernous sinus. Then the tumor is also soft. We can go down. This is the oculomotor nerve exposed. This is a trochlear nerve, which is dissected from the tumor and by manual dissection technique. And further down, we see the, the uh, trigeminal nerve. And then we resect the tumor along the clivus as much deep down as we can go. Taking the scissors to remove it. And then we see the abducens nerve 
and then we stopped. And you see here the optic nerve, carotid, oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, and down is the fifth nerve. And endoscopic inspection shows again, this is the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, and then we can go down and you see oculomotor nerve left, SCA, basilar artery, and down is abducens nerve. And this is a resection what we get, good decompression of the right optic nerve. And then we remove, we make a nasal surgery and the nasal surgery to remove the tumor from the sphenoid sinus. And then we drill the skull base open the clivers and resect tumor from this area. Here's the clivers, this was all. The bone was completely intact, so we could make a good resection without the risk of damaging the carotid. We open the cellar floor and then we resect tumor in this area. But again, it, like in, this, in the previous case, the pituitary gland is infiltrated by the tumor and she has no deficiency. So we did not make a total resection, but just we decompressed it. And then we opened the dura and the clival area to get access to the interdural clival tumor part. And here the tumor is more fibrous. We dissect it. CSF is coming. And then we removed it as much of tumor as we thought is safe without damaging the abducens nerves. Always a problem where the abducens running into this dura to the cavernous sinus. And then we got this uh, resection and this tumor would then observation, uh, underwent observation and further on then radiotherapy. So I think the use of the endoscope in, in this kind of surgery is also um, a beneficial technique like in other tumors in CP angle like vestibular schwannomas or epidermoids. But the major part of course of uh, uh, petroclival tumors is a microsurgical resection. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Henri. You show us your unique experience uh, in uh, those lesions. Uh, all your cases were truly interesting, showing a very interesting uh, aspect. Uh, you highlight the different approaches and the interest of combining uh, those approaches to, to a very good uh, results. Not only the approach you combine, but also the techniques with uh, microscope and endoscope. Uh, it was a great talk. Thank you so much. So I, I suggest we move on now to Marseille. It's a pleasure for me to have with us Professor Pierre-Hugues Roche, who is chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery in Marseille in France. And he will also discuss with us, surely, very interesting cases. Please, Pierre-Hugues, be welcome. We listen to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me, Michael? Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, so I'm trying to share my screen with you. Uh, trying to fix this small uh, technical issues. I guess it, I hope it will work. Uh, I can see, you a, black, I see a black screen. You have a black screen? Yes. So uh, just let me know if it works because now I can see my slides. I hope you can see them. No. Not yet. I don't have your slides. Sebastian, have you the slides of Peru? No, no, no. Uh, uh, yes. yes, now yes. yes. Now it's perfect. Yes. You can see that I'm trying to fix that and to put that on a slideshow and, and to introduce my talk. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this kind of invitation because uh, uh, I could see excellent technical issues uh, from from Henry and from Sebastian. Of course, they, they of course they, they showed us uh, how tricky it is to to overcome the difficulties of reaching uh, these, these these tumors. And uh, uh, all of us, we know how how it's challenging. If you see these ones, we could see that we had on on the on the left uh, part of my slides lateral petroclival meningiomas. Uh, you can understand that those one you can approach. From many different way, anterior petrosectomy or retrosig approach. I, I must admit that both are very convincing and efficient. Uh, conversely, if you have to manage this uh, central skull base, this is very much 
challenging and uh, 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 whatever you are trying to do, you will not be able to achieve a good resection in this case. All of them, they, become, they belong to the group of, uh, of petroclival meningioma that they are, they are pretty much different. Uh, uh, in, in my opinion, when you have to deal with the large ones, it, it's almost impossible and, and probably harmful to, to try to remove everything. You can see here we are on the right side, and this is an anterior petrosectomy, and the regular uh, cadaver anatomy uh, match nicely with uh, uh, the, 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 the usual anatomy uh, we can observe during surgery. This is a case of a, of a fifth nerve which was totally encased by the tumor uh, uh, on both sides, on the, on the, cave, on the Meckel's cave here and in the petroclival area here, here. And obviously you have to leave some piece of tumor. You can see here the, the sixth nerve and the last picture of my, of my uh, uh, operative case show that we had to leave uh, intentionally some piece of tumors at the level of the pons. And this is a clear message that was uh, clearly indicated by Henry. Uh, uh, once you see a, a piece of tumor who is a sticky uh, uh, at the level of the pons uh, uh, vicinity, you have to leave some. So it's, it's almost harmful and impossible to remove everything. So the selection of the approach, I, I won't go through the details because it had been already, uh, already done, but it depends on the goal of the surgery. Of course, the team expertise, you can see that people are very familiar with the, with the retrosig approach. They, they will systematically go through the, the retrosig approach. Conversely, they are uh, teams who are familiar with the petrosectomies and they will go systematically through the petrosectomies. And the team experience matters, I'm sure. Location and extension of the tumor matters as well. And the patient's condition, we will see that uh, through the details uh, later on in my talk, but uh, it's important to to know what you want to do, which, which join the goal of the surgery. Would you like to go for through uh, just a debulking and decompression? Or would you like to go uh, uh, in more radical case? Uh, probably people who are in good conditions, we are, you are young, you will try to, to, to achieve uh, a subtotal resection. Conversely, if you have uh, to face elderly people with a, a poor condition, you will uh, just try to decompress. Uh, and, and don't go uh, through uh, extensive surgery. So you have pro and cons, you have advantage and inconvenience of a, 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 a petrosal approach and the cisternal approach. We saw uh, from Henry uh, told that uh, using a regular corridor uh, frontal temporal octagonal approach, you can achieve excellent surgery. By the way, you have to little bit uh, manipulate the temporal lobe, and you could see that in some cases you, you can expect some atrophy. Usually, you don't have any any uh, uh, clinical consequence of that, but sometimes you, you you do have, which is a, which is an issue. But anyway, uh, you have advantage and inconvenience of of, of uh, uh, cisternal, so retrosegal, octagonal, and and petrosal approach, regardless the kind of petrosal you have to do. This is the case of a, of a combined petrosectomy on the right side. You see, I use this petrosal, uh, combined petrosectomy because the tumor uh, expands from the lower clivus to the upper clivus. It was a midline tumor, and uh, I considered that the one-shot surgery could be achieved using a combined petrosectomy. This is what we did, but by the way, we left some tumor. You have a large amount of fat in the closure here, and I left a small remnant here. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, uh, prone to propose uh, adjunctive systematic radiation therapy in the, in the follow-up of this patient. Uh, because I'm convinced that it will regrow. And this is my experience, and I will show you that later on. Okay, this is an interesting paper coming from the Neurosurgical Review, uh, recently from Predevelo, and they, they showed in this paper uh, uh, the, the way the approach were used in the, in the last 20 years. And you can see that uh, uh, the petrosectomy wa was very popular at the beginning of the, of the, 12th, of the 20th century. And then it's, it's gradually decreasing because this is probably a, a demanding approach. You need a lot of expertise. Conversely, you could see that the, uh, uh, several uh, uh, big players tried to use the endoscopic endonasal approach with some success. And we could see that from, in the hands of Henry and in the hands of uh, Sebastian, of course. But uh, 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 still, this is not very popular. Even the curves are crossing each other. Uh, still, there is a room for each approach. And uh, I'm convinced that endoscopic uh, will never uh, uh, overcome uh, the other approach. 
uh, and there are respective indications for, for uh, regular endoscopic and regular uh, cisternal and regular transpetrosal. So uh, this is our experience we already published in our French journal years ago, uh, about uh, 154 cases we collected from four teams in France. Sébastien was not included at that time in this group, but I hope we will be able to collaborate and give a, 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 a multi-center, including his case. Anyway, uh, you could see that we manage big cases. Uh, this is uh, a clinical baselines of our patients and a lot of them displayed uh, ataxia and of course cranial nerve deficits and uh, some of them displayed hydrocephalus because surgery. This is something which was expected because all these patients were big cases. It were not, we, we did not operate small ones. And this is what the, 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 the extension of the tumors. We classified these tumors according to the primary insertion of the tumors and the secondary extension. And what you can see is uh, usually these patients, they harbor multi-levels, multi-levels tumors, uh, multi-levels uh, involvement because mostly they involve uh, uh, the paracella area, particularly the Makel caves. And uh, uh, this is a big issue because when you have to deal with multi-level uh, tumors, you have to consider an approach that will be able to expose both sides of, of, the, of the tantarium. Uh, this is the approach we used. And that's very, that was very surprising to me to, to, to observe that uh, I was probably the one who uh, operated not exclusively, but to offer the Kawase approach for almost all of my tumors. And conversely, all the centers, uh, for example, for instance, uh, Tours, or even in, in, uh, in, uh, even in, uh, in, in Grenoble, they, used, uh, they were much more familiar with the retro approach. So there is a, a center effect, which uh, uh, of course impact these figures here. Uh, this is what we achieved. As I told you, we did not aim uh, to operate and uh, uh, make a, a radical resection. We obtained that in only 26% of our patients. Uh, uh, conversely, we, we, we aimed uh, um, subtotal or partial resection is in, in the majority of cases. And you see that uh, we offered uh, intentionally radiation therapy, regardless of technique. Sometimes it was fractionation, sometimes it was gamma. Uh, for uh, a, a, a huge number of patients. And I can see you that uh, if we look at the, the results in the follow-up, you see that we had a, a pretty nice uh, follow-up. Uh, it was long-term follow-up. This is the overall survival on the, on the left part, and this is the PFS on the right. And you can see that uh, for the patient that uh, in the case, we did not offer adjunctive RT uh, for the subtotal and partial resection. This is the curve we had. And uh, uh, in the same times, if we compare the curve between the total resections and the subtotal plus radiation therapy, uh, the PFS was the same in both groups. So this is a message that, wa that was already conveyed by uh, uh, Matisson in the past and all these people who studied this meningomath in the long term. And they were uh, 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 apostles of, uh, of gamma, uh, systematic gamma after subtotal resection instead, uh, instead of weight and scan. And this is something I observed personally in my case. All of them, if I left a significant piece of tumor without offering any, any gamma, all of them, they, they, they had regrowth in the, in the follow-up. It's just a question of time. If you leave some, you might expect to have some, some regrowth in the, in the long term. So this is, I guess, an important message. More, more importantly, what was the results we obtained in terms of morbid mortality? And you can see that in the, in the uh, early post-op, 66% of our patients experienced experience a cranial nerve deficit. And of course, this is not the long-term deficit, it was the early post-op, but you can see that significant number of patients achieved that. This is because we had to manipulate the fourth nerve, the sixth nerve, and third nerve, and the, and the trigeminal nerve. As long as you manipulate these nerves, you might expect any a, a kind of deficit, which will recover in, in, in a huge part of them, but which will sometimes remain. Uh, we experienced more than 10% of, of paresis. Uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, comparable, a little bit higher than the inner structure, and we will go through the details of that. And we, we experience a, a perioperative mortality in 4% of case, which is, which, is, which is big, but which is an honest way to show the case in a large number of patients. I remember you, I recall you that we, we treated 154 
which is not so, which is a, a large amount of patients. So uh, taken all together, uh, all the series from the literature, this is what we achieve. So when I see uh, papers publishing zero morbid mortality, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I, I cannot understand that because uh, 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 if you carefully check your patient and carefully report your results, you will see that you, you will expect some complication. Anyway, uh, this is the way we analyzed our mortality in the poster. By the way, I included 60 days, not only 30 days, because you can maintain patients in, in the intensive care unit more than 30 days, and then they die of complications like uh, uh, aspiration pneumopathy or something like that. And I included 60, two months in the post-op, and, uh, and I, I would summarize the major cause of troubles. They were probably sometimes linked to the indication in the selection of patients, sometimes because uh, the surgeons uh, uh, had bad judgment and the bad intraoperative management during the surgery. And sometimes the complication came up because the approach was not the good one, probably the not the good one. Of course, we have complications which are linked to the post-op management, uh, but I will not go through that. So uh, uh, can we predict uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, morbidity? Uh, we had an interesting paper who came up from the Japan years ago from the Kawase group, and who could, uh, uh, um, I would say, calculate uh, uh, the risk of, uh, of, the, of mor morbid mortality, uh, depending on the, uh, the site of the tumor, uh, uh, the, the central characteristic or the lateral characteristic of the tumor. If you are uh, outside this, this line, uh, the morbid mortality will be, will be less severe. And uh, depending on the contrast, the contact with the brainstem, he could modelize uh, the, the ability to, uh, to obtain a gross total or subtotal resection, and he could predict the improvement or the worsening of the symptoms of the patients. It's a radiological, pure radiological analysis of the risk uh, uh, of, mortal, of morbidity. This is very interesting, but of course, there are many parameters you cannot foresee. Uh, for instance, the vascularization of the tumor, the texture, the adhesion, we are not taken into consideration in this, uh, in, in this talk. Uh, there was a very, very interesting paper which came from the Li uh, Chinese team uh, published in, in ACTA years ago. It was a big number of patients. You can see that he, they treated more than 199. Unfortunately, they had a lot of, of cases who were lost of follow-up in this group. And that's why the paper was considered as weak. I'm convinced that this paper is very strong, very powerful, and they analyzed the cranial nerves deficit and the probability uh, to, to the, the odd ratio uh, to get a cranial nerve deficit in the post-op. And they, they could modelize that. And the odd ratio for patients who underwent previous RT or previous surgery was very significant. The age of the patient was an independent factor. The uh, evidence of the pre-op deficit was independent. Again, the size of the tumor, the consistency of the tumor influenced the risk you can see the odd ratio, firm tumor, 20, the odd ratio is 21, which is huge. Of course, the interval confidence is wide, but uh, is, anyway, this is huge. Uh, uh, the, the, the interface with the brain stem was taken into account, but this is very interesting. This is an important message. The approach which was used did not influence uh, the, 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 the risk of cranial nerves deficit. And they did the same for the risk of getting a, a brain stem injury. And what they observed is a, a previous RT age of the patient where risk factor, uh, the side of the tumor, pre-op paralysis, of course, influence the risk of, uh, of having a, a, an amoebaresis or brainstem injury, the tumor brain interface the involvement. But again, uh, the approach was not an independent factor uh, to uh, measure the risk, to increase the risk of, of, of a brainstem injury, which is an important message. Uh, uh, we, we uh, taking into consideration all these findings, uh, we uh, asked ourselves, well, uh, does the general, general condition of the patient impact the outcome? Because it was not published in the literature. And I had a, a resident working with me, Alexandre Roux from Paris. He came with me six, six months and he investigated this parameter. Does the ASA score can influence the more B mortality of our patients? There's the frailty index, modified frailty index, which take into consideration all these parameters 
uh, a previous history of myocardial uh, infarction, the diabetes, all this you can see here on the screen. And finally, does the Charleston comorbidity index could influence, uh, could impact the morbid mortality of our patients? Because till now, we just had uh, uh, radiological parameters, neurological parameters, but the general condition was not assessed. So uh, uh, it came up from the Columbia uh, University uh, team, uh, Jeffrey Bruce, who is a neuro onco guy, and he used the FIT index for the, to assess the morbid mortality of, uh, uh, of the, uh, his surgery for onco cases. And he nicely showed in the case that uh, uh, depending on the, of the frailty uh, 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 scale of your patients, you, uh, you, you obtain a higher risk of mortality, higher risk of severe complications, neurological complication on one side, but non-neurological complication on the other side. And I was impressed by this paper and I tried to investigate that in my own group of patients. So I said, Alexandre, okay, take retrospectively, of course, these patients and try to analyze that in our group in Marseille. And in our, in our 102 patients coming from Marseille, he investigated that, he classified the Friday index, the Charleston, the AJ, and he could calculate that. You can see here, uh, uh, this, which the, the results of our finding, if we just uh, analyze the, the risk of severe neurological import, impairment, we just obtain, this is a multivariate, okay, that the peritumoral edema uh, could influence uh, 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 the, 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 mor the morbidity, the neurological morbidity, but uh, uh, Aze, uh, Charlson, and uh, Friday did not influence. If we look at the severe non-neurological morbidity, all these parameters were independent predictor of risk. And the Charleston was important, but the Asia was important. Uh, the old ratio was 10, which is exceedingly high. Uh, if we looked at the uh, overall Morbi mortality altogether, a good predictor was the frailty index. Uh, and the old ratio was six, which is high. But there is another important issue. This is the neurosurgeon expertise. We did not talk about that previously, but uh, uh, I cutted my, my, my case in between two. Uh, the first 50 ones, the second 50 ones, and uh, my expertise, our expertise greatly influenced the risk of morbid mortality. Of course, this is something that, which is uh, intuitive, but that, uh, at least we could, we could show that uh, in an objective manner. So this is an important message. So if we move back to our uh, major cause of, uh, of, of troubles, morbid mortality, and if we come back to our classifications, I, I'm go briefly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, work with you, share with you a few examples. Uh, for example, selection of the approach. I re really, I'm really convinced that the Kawase approach is a beautiful approach uh, for this uh, double stair meningiomas involving the Makel cave and, uh, and the Petrus apex and going through the anterior petrosol approach which is very nice, you can achieve nice rejection. In this case, this patient, I operate her last week. I, I, I get a six nerve palsy. I did not even see the six nerve. Probably I overlooked, probably I coagulate too much in the Dorelos canal. But anyway, I'm convinced that going through this anterior petrosectomy, it was really linked to my approach. If I did that through a retrosic approach, probably I did not have this kind of, of, of complications. Likewise, you can see on the CD scan post-op, this is an early, very early, you have a contusion here. I did nothing special. I did not even put a retractor on the temporal lobe, but this is what I had. And if we investigate this kind of complication, it influenced the neuropsychological uh, outcome of our patients. This is what we did. And we offer the protocol of cognitive assessment of our patients, not only the ones we operate for meningiomas, but the ones we operate using this approach until petrosectomy for chondrosarcomas, uh, petrus apex, epidermoid cysts, uh, dumbbell shaped trigeminal schwannoma. This is how we did. We investigated many, many, many tests uh, uh, to just to just to investigate the cognitive functions, the memory, uh, the attention, the flexibility, the executive task. We did that in, in a lot of patients, you see, and uh, unfortunately, we did that in the pre-op and in the post-op at least two times, and at least 17 patients could be fully investigated. And this is very interesting because we obtained early in the post-op a decreasing of the performance on the uh, Ray figure copy, on the Boston test, on the TMT, all these scores decrease in the post-op, but hopefully they move back to normal in the long term. So uh, we 
with, I'm convinced that with the interpetrosectomy and probably with the combined petrosectomy, we impact the neuropsychological outcome of our patient. Why? Uh, I say we don't put retractor, of course, yes, but probably the veins are, are uh, uh, involved in this situation. You can see here in this case, uh, this is a dumbbell shaped tumor. You have here, look, this is a temporal basal vein here. If you retract the dura here permanently during four hours, you might expect some infarct here, some venous congestion here, and perhaps this is just an hypothesis. You can impact the IFL, and you know that this IFL, we, we, who works with the uh, uh, IFOF, you know that this IFL probably plays a game, plays a role all in this executive task. This is what we are uh, going to investigate. In. But this is not uh, uh, totally safe to offer the anterobotrosectomy in all these patients. Uh, about the intraoperative judgment, intraoperative management, this case, this is uh, big ones. Uh, you see, this is a central, central skull basement angioma. I always show this example because I overestimate my ability to remove everything. And this is what we did with the combined petrosectomy. Unfortunately, I pushed probably too much my surgery and I had problems with the carotid artery uh, and the patient had a big infarct and finally he died uh, in, the, in the weeks uh, uh, after surgery. So, so the CT is excellent, but the patient died because I pushed too much my surgery and I was too much overconfident and my judgment was probably not the good one. And, and I had to interrupt, I had to interrupt my surgery uh, uh, before. Uh, of course, sometimes you, you, you have operative judgment, but sometimes this is be, before, before that, before that step that you have to say, okay, I would, I would go for a surgery, I, I want. This patient had a huge frailty index very elevated. You see this tumor, he was hemiparetic, he was elderly, and I decided to operate. This was an anterioprosectomy. During the surgery, my MEP dropped. Uh, this is what I had, and the patient uh, 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 turned, turned with, with, with an hemiparesis. And uh, it was a wrong judgment, probably because the selection of the patient before surgery was wrong. And perhaps the good way in this case, elderly patients, huge Charlson, huge frailty, huge ASA is probably to put a shunt here and, and doing no more. And this is, a, I think, a, a key message uh, in my talk. So the key message, uh, ASA and the frailty index plays a role in the prediction of severe MOB mortality. They, they give complementary information. ASA is a subjective score. MIFA is more objective and they have complementary interest. I'm, I'm convinced about that. We need to honestly report our complication and to, to debrief them. Uh, to classify our complication. Was it wrong judgment during surgery? Was it bad selection of the patient? Was it wrong approach? This is something important. Uh, working in high volume centers clearly uh, improve your results. And if you do less, uh, I think you should refer the patients because this is really a challenging, a challenging surgery. And of course, case selection, uh, uh, selection of the approach and interrupt judgment are uh, the backbone of the success of this surgery. Just to, to finish, to end up with my talk, uh, I saw this patient five years ago. At that time, he was 82. He was not disabled. Uh, he was really elderly patients and uh, together we discussed. And I said, okay, now, sir, I won't go for a surgery for you. I will never go for a surgery. You are 82, you are in good shape, I won't go. And he gradually worsened, you see, and recently he came with, to me with a third nerve palsy, trigeminal pain, and ataxia. And I said, you remember what we told? We told that we would, we would not operate you anytime. I had to put him a shunt. I gave him a steroid. He was good during one year. And then he, uh, he had some troubles because of the meningioma. He recently died. To be honest, I did not regret to have this strategy because I'm convinced that if I had to operate it, uh, him at that time, probably uh, I did not take benefits of this uh, four years of excellent, uh, good condition. I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pierre Huyo. A great talk. It's uh, of crucial important to speak on the indication, of course, of technical aspect and uh, Finally, to have the honesty to report the complication rate. Of course, those tumors are difficult to handle. And without a careful analysis of psychological testing of complication, it's uh, almost impossible to improve our result and uh, our way to manage such a lesion over time. Thank you so much.
Now we will move back to, to Paris and uh, Sebastian Folich will uh, end this talk. Please, Sebastian, if you have uh, now your computer is working again perfectly, please. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Sorry for uh, for before, but my my computer completely collapsed. It seems that uh, that it's something uh, that happens quite often in France, uh, Pierre. <laughs> it's a French uh, specialty to have technical issues. So, but Pierre Hugues uh, said most of it uh, because we have exactly the same. Uh, I think the same strategy and the same philosophy. Philosophy, but I can uh, share maybe. Uh, a little bit of uh, of what we do for for large or giant uh, petroclavial but again the message is uh, is quite similar so for large or giant tumor it's uh, it's this kind of uh, of lesion with a significant mass effect on the brain stem uh, sometimes edema uh, very challenging tumor and uh, and Pierre said it uh, very well it's uh, it's a surgical challenge for the surgeon and the, it can be a shock uh, for the patient. Uh, we have, I think, uh, again, the same uh, philosophy. The goal is to have brainstem decompression uh, for sphenopetroclival, sometimes to decompress optic nerve chiasma, decompress five if you have pain. Uh, but uh, quite often we leave a remnant of tumor and the extent of resection uh, depends not only on the surgeon, in fact, it doesn't really depend on the surgeon, but it, it uh, more depends on the tumor characteristic. It's completely different if you have a soft tumor uh, with a nice surgical plan with the brainstem, then you can achieve a complete resection, as I said before. But if the tumor infiltrates the brainstem, the cavernous sinus, you cannot achieve a complete resection and you should not try to do it. For the remnant of tumor, uh, I am not necessarily doing upfront uh, up uh, radiation therapy or radiosurgery, but this is true that if you have a significant remnant in a, in a relatively young patient, he may have issue over time and radiation therapy will be needed uh, uh, because it will grow. But I usually prefer to gain time without any further treatment because sometimes the growth rate of those remnants is very, very minimal. What we do, and uh, maybe a little bit differently from Pierre Hugues, is that I, I systematically do an angio before surgery for large or giant uh, tumors, uh, because it's always interesting to look at the feeders of those meningioma. It's, it's, uh, it's different from one patient to another. Sometimes uh, feeders mostly coming from ascendi ascending pharyngeal, sometimes from branching of the, of the common sinus. And this is interesting because in some cases we do uh, preoperative embolizations, especially for the branches coming from the ascending pharyngeal. You can also uh, embolize the middle meningeal, which is a little bit helpful. It's more difficult for the uh, endovascular guy to, to coil uh, the branches from the cavernous sinus, from the carotid artery, but uh, still it can be very helpful. I had the surprise uh, with a nice embolization to, to, to get to the tumor and to find a very soft uh, tumor, very easy to remove because it was, uh, it was necrosed. It's also interesting to look preoperatively at the feeders coming from the posterior circulation. It's usually associated with brainstem edema, but not always. And this is definitely something we have to be extremely careful of. Whenever I have feeders from the basilar, I am extremely careful with this piece of tumor that I leave on the brainstem. So pre-op embolization, you see we did it in uh, 26 uh, of uh, 50 cases. We do it quite often. Not always all the branches, but few branches can be very helpful. We talked about venous issues. Venous issues are extremely important to consider if you are doing combined petrosal, especially on the left side. Uh, you have to look at the anatomy of the transverse sigmoid sinus, if it's dominant or not, where the vein of labe is draining on the petrosal veins, uh, um, inferior petrosal sinus and superior petrosal sinus. This is important. Addition of uh, venous sacrifice on some degree of retraction of the temporal lobe can, can get to, to, to bad complication for the patient. And it was beautifully shown by uh, Pierre Hugues with uh, neuropsychological testing 
postoperatively. Approach selection, there is multiple factors to consider, size, experience, tumor type, the epicenter, the extension of the lesion, where it goes, above the internal auditory canal, I do the same than uh, Pierre Hugues. I, I uh, use quite often the anterior petrosal approach, Kawase. I, I feel it's, it's very nice, especially when the tumor is going above the tantorium or into Meckel's cave. But approach selection depends also on the vascularization. Uh, if the tumor is mainly uh, fitted by the ascending pharyngeal, for example, there is not necessarily importance to cut the tent to vas devascularize the tent because feeders are not coming this way. So vascularization at the NGO also gives you indication for the choice of the approach. Retrosig versus combine, it's a debate for many, many years. I think it's a question of experience. You have fantastic surgeons that can remove huge tumor with a retrosig, but I still believe that uh, both approach have, doesn't have the same type of risk. And we did this meta-analysis uh, not so long ago. And it clearly sh show, if you look at the literature, and if you compare tumors that have the same size, we should not compare giant tumor with, petro with combined petrosal and small tumor with retrosig. It's not the same uh, pathology. But if we consider, compare similar size tumor, there is more fash, uh, seven and eight uh, complication with retrosig. There is more fourth nerve, six nerve complication with uh, combined petrosal. I like combined because you can look at the tumor from multiple angle of view. With the retrosig, it's only one entry point. And I think it's very nice for cranial nerve preservation, brainstem preservation, uh, vessel preservation. I like also. Uh, to compare the FTOZ to the combined petrosal, and it demystifies the combined petrosal for neurosurgeon. It still needs some training. It's an approach that you need to learn in the lab. I think Pierre uh, spent a, a very long time in the lab uh, uh, learning those approach, but still, it's not necessarily an approach that is, uh, is, should be done by ENT. It's, it can be done by neurosurgeon, the question of combined petrosal is to create a space between the cerebellum and the temporal lobe. When you do an FTOZ, you work along the orbit. When you do a combined petrosal, you work again uh, along the labyrinth. When you do FTOZ, you drill the sphenoid ridge, and this is what gives you the space with the retraction of temporal on, some, on, on the frontal lobe. When you do a combined petrosal, you drill the petrous ridge and you create a space between sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus, and the temporal lobe. And this is the space you need to work. And this is a neurosurgery concept. So I like to compare both. At the end of the combined petrosal, you finish usually with the anterior petrosectomy, which is not very different than doing a, a clinoidectomy at the end of an FTOZ approach, drilling the petrous apex, drilling the anterior clinoid process. The final stage of the combined petrosal is opening the dura, and this is what gives you the space. If you just do the drilling and if you don't open the dura properly, you will not have the space to work because the retrolab corridor is a very narrow, tiny corridor through which you cannot do anything. So opening the dura in a combined petrosal, you cannot do that like you would do it in an FTOZ, but you have to open the temporal dura, you have to cut the superpetrosal sinus, and then you can completely mobilize posteriorly like this, the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, and you see that you open your surgical corridor and you can have the surprise to have a tumor exposed, uh, not so different from exposing a convexity meningioma. Once this is done, uh, the key concept also of combined petrosal is to reach the tumor base first and to devascularize the tumor. The tumor base of a petroclival is quite often the tantorium. If you cut the tent, if you remove the tent, it's like opening the door of the tumor. You open a door on the tumor and you devascularize sometimes most of it because the feeders are coming from the ICA. 
carotid artery through the dura, through the tantorium towards the tumor. So key step of the combine is not only drilling bone, but it's also transposing the sigmoid on transverse sinus, resecting the tent. It was described by Fukushima to really have a wide exposure of your tumor. As a second step, uh, in the combine, you do the anterior petrosectomy. And here also, you devascularize the base, the clival artery coming from the ICA. I show you videos of it. And I think it illustrates quite well the fact that you have a really a nice exposure with this type of approach. There is variation on the technique, either doing the bone flap first or the mastoidectomy first. It, it depends on experience. We do the bone flap first in order to do a cosmetic mastoidectomy to keep the, 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 the convexity of the mastoid to reconstruction at the end. Drilling is not so difficult. It's again like shaving the petrus, shaving the labyrinth, focusing on the petrus ridge. And then you have to expose sigmoid sinus and, uh, and transverse sinus in order to have access to the dura anterior to it and in order to unlock the sinus and to transpose the sinus posteriorly and inferiorly to create this space that I showed you before to expose your tumor. Here is the anterior petrosectomy, peeling the dura from uh, the, the temporal floor, uh, peeling the dura here from V3. Uh, once you have exposed Kawase uh, triangle, uh, you drill it. It's like drilling a clinoid process. It's even easier because you have more space than when you do an anterior clinoidectomy. And you see that you turn around the labyrinth. You really shave the labyrinth. And uh, there is also no need for a complete exposure of the fascial nerve. You just need to know where the fascial nerve is and to understand what amount of bone you can drill behind. This is before opening the dura. Dura of the temporal uh, fossa is open. You need to go far behind uh, the sigmoid sinus because you need to push the transverse sinus down. So the dural incision on the temporal dura need to go above the transverse sinus. Once you have cut the superior pedorial sinus, you need to cut and remove uh, the, the tantorium, anterior cut on the tantorium, posterior cut on the tantorium, and you remove this piece of tantorium, anterior aspect of the tent, that really is like opening a door towards the tumor. And you can see that Opening the dura, cutting the tent is a significant step of the surgery. It takes usually 45 minutes to one hour. But once you have done it, you can have the surprise to have a wide exposure of the tumor. And then the dissection starts like it would start for a convexity meningioma. You have a lot of space to work. You see that my instruments are working in a corridor that is not given by the bone drilling. The corridor in which my instruments are moving is given by this space between the temporal lobe and, uh, and the, the cerebellum and transposition of uh, sigmoid and transverse sinus. So this is something that you cannot do with a retrosig approach. I don't think you can have this amount of control of the cranial nerve with a retrosig approach. Again, I'm not talking about small or mid-sized tumor. I'm talking about big tumors. You can see the six at the end. Completely agree with uh, Pierre Hugues that the six is always a challenge and it's depending on, on the extension of the tumor, but it's definitely the nerve that is uh, more difficult to control. And the uh, uh, rate of post-op six nerve palsy is significant with this kind of surgery, but I don't think it's very different with uh, the retro -seek approach. At the end closure, there is different techniques depending on, uh, on experience. So, uh, this was another case, but I will skip it. When, when you, you have a, a hearing loss before surgery or in case of huge tumor, also with a little bit of hearing loss, it's, it's not a shame to, to, to consider that uh, the, the risk of losing hearing at the surgery is so important that you will drill the labyrinth, which give definitely much more space and in tumors like this one, for example, patient already had some degree of hearing loss with the bone drilling, manipulation of seven and eight. I consider that 
Keeping the labyrinth to save hearing what no, was not worth the price. I drilled the labyrinth, increased the exposure, and it was much easier to me to expose some deep area of the tumor. I'm going fast on, on our series. We did uh, 50, 50 patients since June 2014 of large and giant. We have similar results from, uh, from uh, what uh, Pierre Hugues uh, reported. Hydrocephalus was, uh, was significant in this series because it was big tumors. As you can see, I used mostly combined, some uh, a little bit less anterior petrosal, but it depends on the extension of the tumor. Amount of resection is, is quite similar. It's about 86% uh, uh, of patients who received an extent of resection superior to 80% of the initial volume of the tumor. And it's, uh, it's similar to what, uh, what uh, Pierre Hugues uh, presented. The nerves that do not recover, and this is, I think, we, we, there, we did not insist it, uh, enough on this. The fifth nerve. The fifth nerve is not a motor nerve. You don't see it on the patient's face. But the suffering of injuring a five that was normal before is a day and night suffering for the patient. So I think we, we should ex be extremely careful with uh, five. Uh, five uh, combined with a facial palsy, for example, is, is a challenge for the eye. Uh, and uh, again, five do not recover. Uh, six, uh, third nerve, it recover much more than, uh, than a five. New permanent deficit was uh, significant. We had one bad case, and I will finish with, uh, with this bad case uh, because it's a surgery for which uh, you can say that it's, it's a great approach, everything is doing well, but no, it's a definitive challenge for the patient. And you can have, as uh, Pierre Huck said, it's very bad complication. Here, what is uh, important to notice in this patient? The brainstem edema. There was significant brainstem edema. And uh, I didn't consider this brainstem edema enough in my uh, surgical strategy. I think I, uh, I was too confident with this patient on what happens during the surgery. I tried to leave a carpet of tumor along the brainstem, but the, the thickness of this carpet of tumor is not always easy to define. And uh, at some point, I uh, did a cut off with my scissors and I cut the posterior cerebral artery. And uh, I had to control this bleeding, which was not so easy. And the patient had uh, postoperatively an infarct and he was uh, severely impaired postoperatively because of this. So leaving a carpet of, tum of tumor, it's uh, something I hear quite often. Uh, there is brainstem edema, you leave a carpet of tumor but leaving a carpet of tumor is not so easy because it's not easy to, to, to know how deep you have to go uh, into this tumor and how thin should be this carpet of tumor. What you have to be is extremely careful because finding a vessel in this final carpet of tumor, even if you leave the carpet, you lost everything because you cut the perforators. So I think combined transpetrosal is, is a great technique. It needs specific training in a lab. It needs experience. I, I agree with, uh, with what uh, Mikhail said. It definitely needs uh, to see people doing it in uh, real life. But it's, I think, dedicated to cranial nerve preservation. And I feel that we have better results. Uh, Pierre-Hug said that extent of resection is, is still important for those tumors, especially in young patients. Uh, maybe the patient will be fine for 10, 15 years, but if you operate a patient at the age of uh, 40 years old and he had a recurrence at the age of 55, then it can be a significant challenge. So, so, so that's it. Thank you very much. That's a conclusion, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, during your your talks i received a, a few questions but uh, i think you have uh, answered over time uh, to all those questions uh the subject was uh, covered very exceptionally by all your talks henri pierre Hugues, sebastian you have to be congratulated i think uh, all the aspects have been uh, discussed 
and I, I receive no message of congratulation of you, for you. I don't I don't see if you you can see the message, but uh, I think everybody is happy. There were more than two hundred person, two hundred and thirty person at the beginning, and uh, almost everybody is uh, still present after two hours of a webinar. I think uh, you you were fascinating us. Uh, it's very great. Uh, I think there is no more questions. Uh, you, you answer the question. So I can only say thank you to, to all of you for your participation. And uh, I will invite you for the next webinar, which will be organized on uh, December 16, always at uh, 5 p.m. And it will be, again, a pleasure to discuss uh, some uh, great uh, talk, some, some great aspect of uh, tuberculum cell meningioma or Quenioforangioma, uh, the, the, the program needs still to be refined. Uh, we know already that uh, Henri Schroeder will be present. It will be a pleasure again. So uh, I meet you with great pleasure on December 16. Have a good evening and uh, see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. It was good to see you. Stay safe. Good to see you, all of you, also. And bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. See you very soon. Bye. Bye.